any location like this where there's been so much history, um, there's going to be more and more chances of restless spirits, if you will. It's especially likely if the death is violent or untimely. A person who dies in their prime, um, under tragic circumstances, unresolved circumstances, much more likely that there'll be some lingering evanescence from that. And a place like this, here in the academy, Hospital Point, um, is very conducive to that, especially if you think about the very spot we're sitting in now. Or during the Civil War, rows and rows of hospital tents covered the academy grounds. The academy had moved out for the duration of the war, and it was an army hospital. Much later, there was a mental, a, a lunatic asylum in the parlance of the day here. That burned down. Um, later, uh, this very building in which we now sit was the morgue for the hospital complex here at the academy. And it was as the morgue, right below us where we're sitting, that the young Marine who became the legendary Sutton ghost of the Naval Academy breathed his last breath. Most probably don't know the origins of that story, and it's actually rooted in historical fact. And it was one of the most celebrated cases in the annals of psychic phenomena in this country, and it happened right here. Originally, he was a midshipman here, 1904-1905 year. James Sutton, Jr. From all accounts, he was very pugnacious, high-spirited, therefore his hazing was particularly rough. He was hospitalized after a boxing match, falling behind in his, some of his courses. He didn't make it through. By 1907, young Jimmy Sutton is back here, however, um, as Lieutenant James N. Sutton, Jr., USMC, here for the Marine Officer Training School. And on the night of October 12th, 1907, there was a midi hop in the parlance of the day at uh, then fashionable Carvel Hall, big dance. Several Marines were coming back from this late at night. In this very building, uh, officials on duty heard shots ring out. They charge out there. They rush down this hill. They find a couple of Marines all distraught, freaking out. The story they're getting is that um, one of their fellow Marines lost his mind, shot two of them, and then took the gun and shot himself in the head. They find the Marine who um, shot himself in the head, and they roll him over, and his face is kind of beat up. There's gravel shoved up in his busted up nose. Um, there's a gunshot wound behind his right ear. Doesn't look too good for the guy, but they haul him up this hill. But by 1.20 in the morning, um, he breathed his last breath. That was right below us here in the morgue. Marine shoots other Marines and shoots himself in the head. That becomes the official version. But this particular Marine happened to have a psychic for a mom. She predicted her own mother's death with a witness, finding out hours later she had died, her own brother's death. A telegram arrives from the Naval Academy saying that Lieutenant James M. Sutton Jr. died of suicide at 1.20 a.m. And for 72 hours, she's constantly being visited by his spirit, his actual physical presence that no one else sees. And he's telling her, you've got to believe me. I did not commit suicide. They shot me and stuck that gun in my hand. It wasn't even my gun. If you could see my forehead, you would see that they beat me up before they shot me. Um, the Navy, the official Navy line now is that he committed suicide. The other Marines involved are all sticking to their story and they all have their facts jibing together. But she won't let it go. She becomes a thorn in the side of the Navy brass. And she pursues this doggedly. And it becomes a huge national story for well over a year. It's being covered in all the major newspapers all around the country. Uh, it's a compelling story, obviously. Uh, the grieving mother who has a psychic connection with her son, and his ghost is telling her he wasn't the victim of a suicide. This is important to them more than most people because they're Catholic. If he's committed suicide, he can't get into heaven. He can't even be buried in holy ground. And right over here in Mahan Hall, it wasn't called that then, they hold the Sutton Board of Inquiry in July and August of 1909. The Sutton family brings in the former uh, forensics expert of Washington, D.C., and he's the leading authority in the country at the time on gunshot wounds. And he presents a long and detailed analysis, and he concludes that it would have been impossible for Jimmy Sutton to have shot himself with that gun unless he was, quote, a professional contortionist. The press goes wild. It looks like the 
the, the um, official Navy Marine story of this thing is completely falling apart. It looks like the Suttons are going to get the verdict they're looking for, exoneration of young Jimmy. But when it's all over, the Navy and Marine Corps stick to their original conclusion. Well, it wasn't enough to change the Navy's mind, but it was enough to change the mind of the Catholic Church. And based on the evidence that came out in the Board of Inquiry, they, the Catholic Church agreed to have the body exhumed and to have an autopsy performed. This is done, and it's enough to convince the Catholic Church. And they officially now declare that it was not a suicide. And Jimmy Sutton is reburied, holy water is sprinkled on the ground, and his mother breaks into tears. But there were two reasons that um, his spirit had been restless. One was that he needed vindication. He hadn't committed suicide. The other thing, though, if he didn't commit suicide, that means somebody else killed him, and they got away with it. It was back in March of this year. Um, we'd finished up working day, um, decided to stay and play catch up, and uh, a couple of us stayed. We were sorting out some paperwork, and um, in our office, there's a group of us that work in there, but everyone had gone home. and. Typically when people come in and out of the office, there are a couple of doors, you hear the door slam, you know, and uh, just sitting there, carrying on with our work, uh, I saw someone come by and I called out, hello, you know, we're still here, don't turn off the lights, um, but no one was there and I heard no doors slam and I thought, well, somebody just came into the room, but the doors didn't slam, so I didn't hear them come through and they didn't talk back, so. I walked through the whole office. It's a big room. I completely dived into each cubicle. I thought it was a coworker messing with us, you know, just, you know, trying to spook us out. I got up to see who it was. I thought someone was messing with us and playing tricks on us, but um, I swear I saw somebody walk by, probably around six feet tall, you know, an average height for a, for a tall guy. As people come through and walk up the stairwell, and I just called, hello, no one was there. I'd never heard of the Sutton Ghost um, until just a few weeks ago. I'm conscious of it and I say to myself, it's just a ghost or it might not be or it might be. Just say, hey ghost, I'm leaving, it's okay <laughs> and, and just leave for the day because clearly they don't want me there. <laughs> it's just I want to know what it was It's and it doesn't bother me. I haven't had any more um, but I'm definitely aware of it definitely aware of it. Um, it was probably 2007. Um, I at that time worked for the conferences department and we would stay late. Um, this was probably gosh around 11 maybe 11:30 one evening during the week and um, my boss at the time was doing something and I, I said I need to go out and get a breath of fresh air or something. So I walked downstairs um, on the fourth floor, walked down the stairwell, no one else was here. Um, walked down, opened the door, um, and when I was standing down in the stairwell, I heard um, another door open um, because it, everything just echoes in there. So I heard the doors, a door open and I heard a man's voice, very loud, um, and it even could have been like a, more than one voice because it was so loud that it was kind of beating off the walls. So I couldn't understand what they were saying. So I, I leaned in and I said, excuse me. And then I heard my name. I said, excuse me. And it was completely quiet. And I thought, well, that was strange. But I kind of thought maybe it was the cleaning people. The hair on the back of my neck kind of, because it went silent quick you know, really fast. And um, I walked in, I shut the door, walked back up to the third floor, looked in the window, it was dark, the emergency lights were on, nothing was there. Walked up to my boss's office at the time, and she would have had to have heard it as well because it was that loud and her office isn't, wasn't that far from the stairwell. And I asked her if she had heard it. I said, did you hear that? Who was that? And she said, I didn't hear anything. And I said, no, it was a, a, a man's voice. Somebody said my name. I said, I don't know what else they said. She said, oh, I didn't hear anything. And I said, well, maybe it was the cleaning people or something. She said, they've been gone for hours. 
and she said, do they really know your name? And I said, I don't think so. So she kind of looked at me and she said, um, maybe we should go. And I said, okay, we'll go. But it's that feeling that you get when someone else, another presence, another person is in the room, you can feel it. And there's been many times you haven't heard anything, but you feel it. You feel like, oh, somebody came in. And you get up and you look around and there's nobody there. There's really no one in the building because people leave at 4.30. And I hadn't heard about um, James either. Hadn't heard anything about that. I mean, this is, an, this is a, this place has been here forever. Many things have happened. A lot of people have, un, you know, unfortunately passed away in the hospital. And um, so who knows? You know, there's definitely things here. Here, here.